Jim Jackson set to join us there. He's all all right. On loan, NBA on TNT, Clippers analyst. He does it all. He was on the call game two, Warriors and the Kings. He's on the call for the Lakers Grizzlies tonight. He's a busy man, and rightfully so. He's done a great job. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us. Your reaction in the moment with what happened with Draymond, and now your reaction after the commissioner decided to suspend him. Well, we saw the play right there. I saw what Sabonis did, which, you know, shouldn't have happened. But it, in the midst of a lot of things, things go on. So both were in the wrong in that perspective. Sabonis should have never grabbed Draymond. Draymond should have never stomped down. It was reaction to what happened because it was a physical game up to that point. You know what I'm saying, Dan? So both teams were competing. Um, I, I kind of knew at the time that it was either going to be a flagrant one or flagrant two just because of the excessiveness in which Draymond came down with his foot. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what happened. Now, I didn't think he was going to be suspended. Okay, I just knew flagrant two, done for the game, play on, he comes back. But as you know, and as we know, there's a track record there, and they said it in the statement, in regards to having some other forms of unsportsmanlike conduct so the, I think the commissioner's office uh, took that into consideration. I am surprised by it, um, that it went that far. But um, it's an unfortunate situation for Golden State, but I think for the series itself in regards to Draymond not being able to play. But again, it goes back to Draymond making a decision at that point, too, on what he wanted to do. But, Jim, he's supposed to frustrate the opposition. He's not supposed to be frustrated. And mm-hmm. and that I think if there's the stomp, now he went back for second helping that hurt him, and if he would have been a little bit more contrite after the game, which he's not capable of doing, but just said, and and not done all the WWE stuff, I I, I think he could have he could have gotten by with a fine here, but the commissioner's in the audience, and you're watching him kind yeah. of take over center stage. Nobody, yes, yes. why doesn't anybody from Golden State grab him? Because they can't, because they don't have anybody. They don't, they don't have anybody. I think when the David West was there, it was Yeah, different. okay. With David West. Okay. I think, and to your point too, the escalation with the fans added incentive for what I think the decision ultimately came down to. Because you think about it, Adam Silver sitting in the stand. So he's hearing the backdrop of the fans and what they're saying too, in regards to kick him out. He shouldn't be playing dirty play, all this other stuff. So all this stuff is going through his mind. And I can't think for the commissioner, but based on the statement, they took all of this into consideration. It wasn't just the stomp. It was the stomp. It was the fan interaction. It was probably Draymond not being contrite afterwards. And it was his past. Does it make it right or wrong? I don't know, but it's a decision that Draymond allow the commissioner's office to make. He put that in their control yeah. and took it out of his control. Yeah. At the end of the day, forget what happened, right, wrong, or indifferent, with, with Sabonis and, and, and grabbing the leg, at the end of the day, you still can make a decision on what you choose to do and how you choose to handle it. Now, if you want to handle it in the way you want to, okay, fine. You want to stomp them, fine. Then there are repercussions to that. And you got to understand once you have repercussions, that now the decision making of what happens next is out of your control because of your past. If that's Kevon Looney, probably doesn't happen. It, it doesn't go down like that. But it's Draymond Green. Different scenario. Let's look at the series, though, itself, because I thought that lost in the headline was Sacramento showed composure, it was a tight game. And they won the game. They're supposed to win those games. Golden State, once again, is going to have to win a game in Sacramento if, yeah. if they're going to advance. So let's handicap this series now with five games left. I think Golden State can get two at home. I don't think they played their best basketball, but they haven't played their best basketball on the road all year. Yeah. Now, you can't take anything away from the level of maturity that the Kings displayed. I think that's what you're talking about. See, Mike Brown has done a fantastic job of a couple of things. I mean, this team, they streamlined their roster. And what do I mean by that? Is that they had a lot of overlapping positions before where guys didn't really understand what their role was because they had a bunch of forwards playing and guys trying to jockey for position. And was just, it, you really didn't have continuity. When they made the trade with Halliburton, and they loved Halliburton, 
but they knew that he couldn't play alongside of De'Aaron Fox because both needed the basketball. So that was the first step into what we see Sacramento being today. And Mike Brown, he's grown as a coach since his Laker days, since his Cleveland Cavalier day. We always talk about players maturing. Mike Brown said, listen, back when I was younger, I used to worry about X's and O's, practice times and, and getting plays right and all of these things on the court. He said, as he learned and matured as a coach, when he's at Golden State, he understood that it was, okay, how do I connect with my players on and off the court? How do we develop camaraderie off the court? How are they with their family and their family life? All these other things that brought this team together. So now you can coach your best player, De'Aaron Fox, extremely hard without any pushback because they understand that you care about them more as a person than as a player. So that's the Sacramento side. The Golden State side, here's the issue, Dan. They turn the ball over too much. Yeah. Okay. And you can say, well, they've always done it. Yeah, but their margin of error was bigger then because they can get defensive stops. There's ways that they could play to offset turning the basketball over a lot and still win games. Their margin of error right now is a lot smaller. They're not the same defensive team. They're not as deep in regards to what once they once were. So now – those turnovers that happen early in the game or mid third quarter, they come back to cost in particular on the road. So that's the issue. That's the, that's the challenge I see with Golden State, especially trying to win one in Sacramento against a feisty, hungry, determined, and quite mature young Sacramento team. Talking to Jim Jackson, he'll be on the call tonight. It's the Lakers Grizzlies game two. What's the availability of John Morant? We're still waiting to see. You know, it's unfortunate because it was the hand that he had hurt. It was taped before, and you saw he came down kind of a bit back. Yeah. Um, so we're still trying to wait to see what's going on with that. So it would probably be a game-time decision, I would think, or something close to it later in the day. It's weird to be on a bandwagon of a team that nearly lost the play-in game, but I like what I'm uh, seeing with the Lakers. Uh, should I be liking what I'm seeing with the Lakers' big picture? Could they be the best yeah. team in the Western Conference? They could be. I mean, uh, Clippers, you know, Paul George comes back, and I'm biased from that perspective in regards to their depth and what they have. They could be pretty formidable. And, I, and, you know, going into the playoffs, too, I thought that the teams with the higher seeds, four, five, and six, were probably better than or as competitive as the top three seeds, Denver, Sacramento, and Memphis. Yeah. Unlike the East, you know, it's kind of a separation outside of Giannis being hurt with, you know, Milwaukee, uh, 76ers, and also Boston. Those three kind of separated themselves. Um, Rob Polinka did a great job, an outstanding job with the trades because he got limp, he got defensive presence, he got some more shooting. Um, the, the team is now able to compete at a different level. Um, you have multiple ball handlers that can make plays when LeBron is not in the game which is what they were looking for. And AD has been healthy enough to be able to carry the load, which, as you know, is the most important key to anything else. So I, I like where the Lakers are at mentally because they feel different. I was around the team um, last night, and they feel a lot different than what they did earlier in the year from a confidence perspective. I mean, so it's tangible. It's something that they're exuding that confidence. Oh, big time. And you think about this, too, and this is not taking anything away from Memphis, but I always thought that even Memphis Memphis healthy with Steven Adams and Brandon Clark, they still were growing from a basketball maturity perspective. And I think that's very important to understand, a basketball maturity, not that they're not mature young men, but a basketball maturity to win it in a playoff series against a Lakers team, in a seven-game series against a LeBron James and a Dennis Schroeder, and a Anthony Davis. I don't know if they've gotten to that point yet because you got to be able to be focus in on the little things that count, the little intricate details, not let the outside forces take you away. And I'm not sure that Memphis is there yet. They have a lot of bravado. And I love the youthfulness, the, the, the youthfulness that they have, but you're playing against a more mature Lakers team with guys that have been there and done that. And I thought that favored the Lakers going into this series. I, I'm surprised sometimes when players get in LeBron's face. 
They challenge mm-hmm. LeBron. They say things to LeBron. And they nobody ever did that to Michael Jordan. Yeah, he did. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh what, yeah. What, the Pistons? Oh, me, Mike, Mike and I got into it. Now, I'm not, and I'm not saying that I'm Kobe Bryant or somebody else, but I wasn't going to let Mike just walk all over me. Okay. You, you know what I mean? Okay. At all. We got into it. We got into it a lot. I got into it with Kobe. I mean, a lot of players do it. Now, the result of that may be something <laughs> totally different. <laughs> hey, Dan, at the end of the day. But – as players, okay. So you get in Jordan's face because Memphis is not afraid of LeBron. They, as, as they shouldn't. Yes. Well, I mean, why should? But no, just respect, level, though. It, the respect, okay, though. It, the respect. The respect. It's a, it's a difference between being very competitive and want to compete and having disrespect. Yes. Two two different things. It feels like disrespect I, to LeBron. It well by from, some of the Grizzlies. Dylan. From from well, yeah. it's really Dylan. Yeah. That's that. That's disrespect. But I don't think yeah, people you, uh, disrespected you, Mike. You did. Isaiah did. <laughs> well, he does now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he didn't. He didn't care then. But did he it's say about, it in a way that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Back then, and you know, it was little innuendos in the press conferences and things they said mm-hmm. about Jordan. Okay. You know, in regards to them not Jordan not being able to beat them. Finally, they, they did. Okay. On you know, but they, oh yeah, I mean they talked about Bird. Think about this. Think about who was it that's uh, Isaiah? Remember that quote he said about Bird about if he wasn't a white guy, he no, wouldn't be getting all was, of this. Yeah, if he was a black guy, he'd be just another it, forward. But it, that was it, exactly. I was there for that. Rodman and Isaiah both said that. Yeah, but the, it, it, and that a th- sound of disrespect? Yes, it did. Okay, and you then we saw, the end, re- always, we saw the end. We saw the end result. We saw the end result. <laughs> and some guys, you just, you just, hey, Dad. Some guys, <laughs> you just want to leave alone. You know what I mean? And and Larry Bird was one of them, Michael Jordan. But that's a competitive nature to me with guys. I just don't like. I don't. I, I don't mind a guy going out and talking junk. I don't mind that. But don't just don't be disrespectful. Because LeBron James, I, I don't think you have to bow down to him. I think you have to compete. I think he respects that when. The, the greatest players respect when guys come at them because that pushes them to another level. But the, if you're going to be disrespectful, then there's some things that come along with that too. <laughs> and more importantly, Dan, you got to be able to back it up. you got to be able to back it up. If you're going to talk all of this the whole time and can't back it up, you know, it's just, it's just wasted breath. But you can see the light going on probably if you do it to Kobe or Mike. Like, you yeah. know that you know what you've done. You've tugged on Superman's cape, and now is when you're saying, "I got to hold up my end of the bargain here," because I know got to. I know they're coming at me. <laughs> well, but, and it's a lot easier to to talk to a 38 year old LeBron who's not the same kind of player. Okay, it's like talking to, talking junk to Mike when he was in with the Wizard. Now he can still go off and give you 40, 50. But it's not the same as it was a young Mike in Chicago when he could just had the full born energy to go out and just beat you not only offensively, but more important, defensively, really get up into you and change the game as well. So it's a lot easier to, to talk a little bit more smack to a 38 year old LeBron <laughs> than it was when he was, what was he, when he dropped on um, Detroit when he was in Cleveland the first time when he had like 25 in the fourth quarter and was going off for what he did to Boston when he was in Miami. That's a whole different animal. <laughs> uh, do you think Jordan would have load managed if he was playing now? It's hard. I don't, I don't but the person I was like saying, would Kobe load manage? Uh, I would say I no. can't imagine. I, I can't imagine. Well, I, I say because does Giannis load manage? No. Does Dame Lillard low manage? No. Does Steph low manage? No. Those guys, even though they're brought up in this era, they're built a little bit different. They think a little bit different. You know, you know what I mean? Kobe and Jordan, they, it was about the game. Now, their perspectives would have been different because they grew up in this era playing a different way. I don't think Michael Jordan would be the same Michael Jordan we saw in the mid-'90s. Why is that? Because Michael Jordan loved to get on that right block or that left block and post up. You don't see a lot of that. So Michael Jordan growing up as a young youth playing basketball, he wouldn't have been posting up as much because the game has changed around him. 
he would be more shooting on the perimeter, pick and roll, stuff like that. Not that he wouldn't be dynamic, but I just think mentally he would be a different kind of player because of the approach of how he grew up playing the game. Always great to visit with you. Have fun tonight, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I just want to ask. I mean, I, I like pizza, too. You know what I mean? I, I do like pizza. No pork, but I, I take the pizza, though. You can have, like, a margarita pizza I'm just, on the side I'm for just, me. Open invite to the man cave, Jim. <laughs> you want to come into my dojo? I got a basketball hoop here. No, I need to get some golf clubs. I got you, got. you still got the putt. I I got my uh, my golf simulator here. There you go. There we go. Oh, so I, I, no I'll, no basketball, I, just golf. No basketball. No, just golf. Because I'd like to shoot against you. Well, we can do that. We can we play a little horse. How about blindfolded free throws? <laughs> Bet all day long. Oh. Well, you better make eight out of ten. What do you mean eight? I was thinking nine or ten. What do you mean? All right. Then then you probably <laughs> beat me. Maybe. <laughs> but I'm going to make 80% from the line blindfolded. Okay. Bet. What did you shoot? What was your career? You did, you weren't a great free throw shooter. Oh, yes, I was. No. Yes, I was. Great? Yes, I was. Look, look it up. What were you? One year. 83? One of my, later, my, my later years, I was in the 90s. Right? Okay. All right. I had to change my game, brother. Paul- <laughs> Paulie, check, check, see if Jim's telling me the truth there. Yeah, I got uh, at age 34, he shot 93% second in the league. All right, make- Car- career eight- <laughs> 83%. 83. I just told, I said 83% for your, as a free That's throw shooter. really good shooter for Yeah, shooting. for you. I shot 93 <laughs> at, at, at 34 years old. What do you mean? I'll shoot it at 66 years of age. That's different shooting it in your man cage than being on the court. I know that. In front of everybody. I know that. Come on. I know that. Come on. This is not the small gym and after gym. After, after Jordan has torched you for 40, and then you go to the line, you knock down a yes. couple of free throws. Hey, I had a couple of really good games against I Mike. know. It doesn't, it doesn't go unwarranted. <laughs> he, had a, he had a lot more on me, though. Yeah. Uh, have fun tonight. Thank you again. I will. Thank That's you. Uh, Jim Jackson, NBA on TNT. He'll be on the call for the Lakers Grizzlies. Back after this.